Hello everyone, we are now going to move on to chapter 8, which is our long-term assets. And there are several different kinds of long-term assets, and there's several different ways that we can treat our long-term assets. And so this chapter goes over all of them. I'm going to go ahead and get started here. There are three basic ty types of assets. There's fixed assets, which you can see, feel, touch, thing things like airplanes and cars and furniture and that kind of thing. And then there's intangible assets, which you can't see, but are still worth a lot. And then there are natural resources, which uh, would be like coal or oil or diamonds or that kind of thing that a company may own um, and is, is actually extracting. So those are also different kinds of assets. All right, so as for fixed assets, I just broke down some of the elements that we think about about with our fixed assets. So one kind of fixed asset is a land, and there's also land improvements that go along with that. So we're gonna figure out how to classify those different things on the balance sheet, as well as what to do with our buildings, machinery, furniture, and fixtures. These are all just different kinds of fixed assets. So you can think of it like, again, anything that you can feel and touch and see, that's what's called a fixed asset. When we purchase fixed assets, we may do what's called a basket purchase, and I'm gonna go over that with you as well. And another thing to think about with an asset is do I capitalize that as an asset or do I expense it? And sometimes you expense things on an asset or you actually create extra value for that asset. So that's capitalization versus expensed. And then finally, what do we do when we sell an asset? You'll also notice there's another box over here called depreciation. And that's a very important part. So we know that when we purchase a car, for example, the minute we drive it off the car lot, that car has lost some of its value. That's very similar to a company maybe buying a delivery truck and they buy that delivery truck to deliver their goods. So after a year, the actual value of that delivery truck has depreciated. So we take that value that's been used and we expense it because it's really part of our doing business. So, so fixed assets are depreciated. And there's an example of a big fixed asset. Okay, another kind of an asset is an intangible. So this could be a patent, trademark, copyright, goodwill. I show you my favorite one, which is Reebok. If you were to just show me this red triangle over here, I'd be able to identify that that was Reebok. Similar to one of the slides I just showed you earlier where you had a golden arch. That was obviously everybody knows that that's McDonald's. So that's a good example of a trademark and those are obviously very valuable too and very protected. So we have patents, trademarks, copyrights, and goodwill, and all of these things are not really depreciated because that doesn't make sense. They're not really losing their value, kind of like a delivery truck when we use it. So we do what we'll call amateurize, and I'll go over the details of that. Okay, and the third kind of asset is a natural resource. So those kinds of resources get what we call depleted. So obviously if we're um, in a coal mine, there's only a certain amount of coal that's in that mine, and as we take that coal out, we're depleting or reducing the amount of coal that's in there. So that's what we do is we'll deplete a natural resource. Okay, this is um, a company that I, I thought it would be really good for you to kind of have something in your head about the how things actually work. So there's a company out there called Zoom Pizza and they deliver pizzas and they use robots to help create those pizzas and then get them out to people. Anyway, it's kind of a neat little business model. If you click on this link right here, it will take you out to a YouTube video. I'd like you to go out and watch that video. So pause my video, go out and watch that video and then come back and we're gonna talk about that. So if you were to click on here, with any luck at all, you'll wind up over here. And it's all of two minutes long. So, so that we can spend um, more it's just kind of an interesting thing. And it's kind of neat to see how they're doing it. So anyway, go there and I'll help you kind of relate what we're talking about in this chapter to that pizza. 
All right, so let's go back and talk about our fixed asset. So you can see we're on kind of that first type of an asset called a fixed asset. So there's land and land improvements. So this has everything to do with how do I write down the value, like what do I write down for the value of land when I actually purchase land? And you may think, well, geez, that's really easy. Whatever the price is of that land, that's how much the land is worth. Well, it's not that easy. So we do for sure take the purchase price, but then there's things that we can add that will go and be written down as the actual land price. So in addition to, let's say I paid a million dollars for an acre of land somewhere in California, which wouldn't be too far-fetched, um, and then maybe I have to clear away the land so that I can put a building there. If there's already a building there and I have to remove it, all of those costs are also added to the actual line item called land on my balance sheet. What else is included? Surveying the land, any kind of legal fees, transfer fees, commission that gets paid. Those are all added in to the price of the land, anything, and I put it up here, anything that gets it ready for use, okay? Now, that's the land itself. We also have land improvements, like signs and lighting, and maybe making driveways, maybe paving a parking lot, putting fences around it, adding sprinkler systems, that kind of thing. Those all go into the price of the land improvement, okay? so. Here's how I might commute, uh, compute the actual land price. So here I've got a purchase price for some land. I paid realtor commissions, transfer fees, survey fees. I removed a building. I graded the land, so maybe I flattened it out so I could put my own building there. Anyway, so you add all of these legitimate costs of acquiring that land and getting it ready for use, and it worked out to be $99,100. So when I make my journal entry, I'm going to put over here my land, there's my $99,100. And then if you look over here on the second part, what else did I do? I put some fencing in, I put some sprinklers in, I put some lighting in, maybe I paved it, you know, landscaped it, whatever. All of those things are considered land improvements. So if I add all my land improvements together, come up with 12,200, that goes in as a separate line item called land improvements. So name of the game here, know which one goes where. All right, so the land, anything that goes into the price of the land is to get it ready for use. These are actual, and you can kind of that's pretty common sense that those would be additions to, those would be making it better, okay? And then the whole thing would be, if I was borrowing the money, then that would go out on a notes payable, okay? All right, so let's talk about buildings. So when I construct a building from the ground up, all of the material, labor, overhead, everything that goes into actually constructing that building, in addition to the permits, the architect fees, um, all the other kinds of construction costs, basically anything it takes me to build that building is what I'm gonna mark down for my building cost. Now, if there's already a building on my property and um, I just purchased it as it is, if I have to renovate it or repair it, paint it, whatever, I also um, will include that as well as all the legal fees and the brokerage and commission fees and of course the original purchase price there. I wanted to make sure you didn't forget that. So it's basically what did I pay for that building and what did it take me to get that building into operational use for me and that's what I'm going to write down as the cost of that building and that's my asset on the balance sheet. Okay, so here's, if you think back to Zumi Pizza, you may even be able to identify some of their fixed assets and whether those fit into the land, the building, the machinery, that kind of thing. So, you know, perhaps the, the, the building where they make their pizzas initially, right? They had to probably purchase that land. There were probably commissions that were paid permits that were pulled, you know, that kind of thing. And then you can think about the machinery that they bought, all of that, um, and the building that they had to build. They probably built that from scratch unless they used a warehouse and started out with that. But you get the idea. 
Okay, so now we're going to talk about whether we capitalize something, and this, this comes to the machinery or the equipment, or whether we expense it, okay? So capitalizing an asset means getting it ready for use. So if I buy, um, let's say I'm Zumi Pizza and I buy a new pizza oven, right? I am going to put down whatever I paid for that purchase oven, a pizza oven, <laughs> plus the delivery charges, plus the sales tax, and then whatever it took me to install and test out that pizza oven, all of those things are going to be written down as the cost of that piece of equipment, okay? So anything that gets it ready for use. And um, on the other hand, once I have that pizza oven or my truck or, you know, whatever fixed asset I have, um, that's working for me anytime I do any kind of repairs or maintenance costs on this um, then we would do an expense for that so this is regular upkeep right so if I have um, my pizza oven and it now needs new grease to keep the arms moving and the pizzas running through or maybe I have a technician that comes out and tweaks it from time to time we're not going to capitalize that cost because it's just regular repairs and maintenance so that's kind of what I'm trying to do and get you to see over here is what things get expensed and what things get capitalized. So if it's an improvement, if it's an add-on, if it makes it a better machine, then we're gonna capitalize that cost. If it's to uh, further maintain that machine, keep it operational, then that's gonna be an expense. And so here I'm just giving you uh, some hypothetical numbers, but I think this is a good example. So um, if I'm gonna buy a piece of uh, machinery or a piece of equipment, then uh, maybe I have this purchase price, I've got sales tax, transportation, insurance for shipping, installation, and then any testing. So I just uh, put some numbers together. So the total of all of this, when I purchase the equipment, you can see I put when purchased, is 91 thousand five hundred dollars so when I make the journal entry for that it goes into equipment ninety one thousand five hundred dollars notes payable or cash or however they paid for it ninety one thousand five hundred dollars now over here I've also included some other kinds of things so those are all capitalized that's what we do is we put this into the asset called equipment that's capitalizing it when we have other things that go on like repairs tune-ups here's some insurance any kind of maintenance taxes uh, that kind of thing that are incurred after the asset is in operation are actually expense so here you can see I added the repairs and the tune-ups together I call that an equipment expense for eight hundred dollars and I put an accounts payable there if I didn't pay cash and then here's my insurance for three hundred dollars and that's an insurance expense so those things are all expensed and you can even see here I said oh this when we purchase is capitalized these things when incurred for maintenance and repairs and just ongoing you know operation of it then these things are expense so hopefully that helps you separate those out another thing for us to consider is what we call a basket purchase and this doesn't have anything to do with purchasing little baskets this is actually what happens when we buy more than one asset at the same time and there's a single purchase price and we don't know how much to put down for our land versus the buildings versus the machinery dirt you know if we just uh you know which is very typical if i go and buy a house i'm just going to make a uh an offer and get an offer accepted for a one single purchase price they don't sell me the land for you know two hundred thousand and the house for four hundred thousand no they just put everything together and say this whole kit and caboodle is six hundred thousand dollars so this is what we call a basket purchase and maybe there's some furnishings inside or a, you know whatever it's all one big purchase price so how do as a business if i were to keep track of how much i have in land and how much i've got in buildings and how much i've got in equipment but yet i bought it all at the 
same time, how do I kind of organize all of that? So this is what we're gonna do. So we're gonna take the total purchase price based on the relative fair market value of those individual assets. So hopefully this next screen will explain it. Okay, so say for example, um, the uh, I buy something and um, the estimated fair market value of the land is 200,000, the building is worth 700, and the equipment inside is worth 100,000. So that all together, the fair market value for that is a million dollars. But if I paid 900,000 for that, how do I figure out how much in land I write down? Because I don't really want to write, write down that 200,000 because I'm not paying a million for that. So it's fairly easy. All we have to do is take, okay, well, all that stuff I'm buying is adding up to a million dollars. So how much of that is allocated to the land? So I simply take the $200,000 for the land, divide that by a million. Oh, well the land is, makes up 20% of what this whole thing is um, valued at, right? The building is 70% and the equipment is 10%. So now I've got my happy little allocation percentages. So then the next step is pretty straightforward too. So then I say, okay, well I paid 900,000 for this thing. So then actually 900,000 times the 20%, I actually paid, if I were to separate all this out, which I do as a business need to write down all these individual um, amounts for my assets, then my land is worth the 100 180,000. So that's what I would write down for the land. The building is going to be written down at 630 and the equipment is 990,000. So you can see that I added it all up and the purchase price is the $900,000. And I've allocated all of my individual things that I purchased out like here. So you'll probably want to study this and maybe review that again, but that's the idea. Okay. Thank you, Allie. So, here are the ordinary repairs, just reviewing the capitalizing versus expensing. Ordinary repairs are expensed. Extraordinary repairs that may extend the useful life of an asset are capitalized and anything that makes it a better one. So for example, on my Zumi pizza, when they put a pizza oven in the delivery truck, that bettered that delivery truck. It turned it into something that was more than just a truck. It was actually an oven on wheels. So that would be a betterment. Okay, and then finally here, I give you some more examples of expenditures after acquisitions and what you do with those things. So if I repair something, right, and it's just to give it um, the same level of benefits that they've been experiencing from that, that is a current benefit and I expense it. Repairs and maintenance that actually increase the future benefits so that wouldn't include things like tires, because tires, you just run them, right? And that just if I put new tires on, certainly they're gonna work in the future, but it's not gonna make my car a better car, unless it wrecks. I mean, you know, obviously if you have bad tires, it might wreck your car. All right, so anyway, uh, but if it's a major repair that increases future benefits, maybe I put a new engine in my car, well, that would be capitalized, okay? An addition is adding a new component and that obviously benefits you in the future. So that would be like, um, I don't know, a new component might be uh, a trailer hitch or something like that. That would be capitalized. An improvement is made being a major, like it's really making it a better thing and that would benefit the future and also be capitalized. And then, if you have a legal defense on an intangible asset, so I'm kind of switching gears into the intangible, an incurring litigation cost is perhaps a future benefit, so we're going to capitalize that, but if it winds up that we lose that case, then we're going to expense it. Okay, let's move on to intangibles now. Okay, and now we're gonna move on to the intangibles. So this is just a review of a slide I showed you earlier. These are the different major categories of intangibles, and again, we're going to amateurize those. So what is a patent? 
So patents are an exclusive right to manufacture a product or to use the process. So I gave you an example of a toilet paper roll, believe it or not. There was a patent on how to wrap paper toilet paper and I thought that was kind of fun. So this is an example of a patent. It even has a patent number on there as well as, wow, it was done in 1891. So when a firm purchases a patent, it records it as an intangible asset at the purchase play price plus whatever cost it uh, took them to get that patent um, under them. So uh, when they, de on the other hand, if they develop this patent internally, maybe Apple did that for their iPhones, then they expense the research and development as it incurs. Um, <clears throat> and they'll record the patent asset account for the legal filing fees um, if it's done internally. Okay, so those are just kind of ways. So it's it's something that it can either be developed internally or it can be purchased. And um, so there's a couple different ways to do that. But it's an exclusive right to manufacture. So they're usually granted for a period of 20 years. And again, it's capitalized when purchased, and it includes the legal fees. Okay, so um, this is kind of a nice summary too because if, it, if I purchase it, I capitalize it with the purchase price and all the legal filing fees. When I develop it internally, the only thing I capitalize are the legal and filing fees to get that patent secured as ours. So anything it took us to figure out how to do that patent, those would be considered research and development costs and they're expensed. Okay, so what's a copyright? Well, copyright is an exclusive right um, of protection that's given to the creator of a published work, like a song, film, a painting, you know, book, even computer software, and games, and things like that. So the copyright, once granted, is protected by law, and it gives the creator the exclusive right to reproduce or sell as they see fit that particular thing that they've developed for 70 years. So a copyright, uh, it also allows them to, you know, if I've created a, a song and someone has infringed on that and hasn't been given the rights to produce my song, then I can go after them. So that's just an example. All right. So granted for 70 years uh, and um, it allows them to pursue legal action if, some, if they feel like somebody infringed on their copyright and the accounting of the copyright. So if I purchase a copyright, it's almost like that of a patent, right? So um, I would capitalize the cost plus any legal and filing fees that go along with getting that copyright. Okay, so what's next? Those are trademarks. So it could be a word or a slogan, like finger looking good, if you remember that. And the trademark identifies the company product or service with that particular trademark. You can even probably guess what that trademark is for. So um, the trademark asset um, availability is, renew is renewed for a uh, 10 year period of increments indefinitely. And if you purchased a trademark from a company, then any of the legal registration and design fees are capitalized along with that, and advertising costs are expensed as you get them. So Reebok again is my favorite trademark. You may remember a couple of these. So you remember the finger looking good is Kentucky Fried Chicken, and because you're worth it is L'Oreal. There are some things that money can buy for everything else. There's MasterCard. So I thought you'd remember a couple of those. All right, so what's a franchise? Franchises are also, um, some of that is an intangible that you're going to purchase. So if you were to purchase like a 7-Eleven, for example, and open up your own 7-Eleven, then there are certain fees that go along with actually purchasing a franchise and those fees are capitalized. So 
um, it's the exclusive right for them to for you to be a 7-Eleven and sell the products according to the specifications that have been set out in the franchise agreement for a certain particular area. So again, as I mentioned, the initial fee is an intangible asset and recorded as such, and then the periodic payments made to the franchise or depending on what the agreements are, are expensed as they are incurred. So I thought you might be interested in the number one franchise in America, which is Subway, followed by 7-Eleven, followed by Hertz, and finally Pizza Hut. Okay, so then we have something called Goodwill. Now, Goodwill is not the Goodwill Industries. This is actually um, an asset that is recorded on the books when and only when one company purchases or acquires another company. So how do we figure out how much of the company we paid for in like what that company is really worth versus the purchase price? And I'm going to take you through an example, but this is in general how I'm going to record and calculate my goodwill. So I'm going to take the purchase price that I paid for something less what I'm getting for that company and the rest of that is known as goodwill. Okay, so let's take a look. I've got one company that I'm gonna uh, that acquires another company for thirty-six million dollars. Now, what is that company getting that's purchasing it? Well, they're getting assets of fifty million, and they're getting liabilities, which I'm gonna take away from the assets of twenty-four million. So, what this company is actually worth is twenty-six million dollars but I paid 36 for it, how can that be? So look at this, here's the fair value, these are the assets I'm getting, these are the liabilities against those assets, so sort of the net net of it all is I'm getting about 26 million, so if I paid 36 million for this company that only has 26 million in assets, that means that I must have paid 10 million in goodwill. Now, why would I do that? Well, because there's more to a company sometimes than just what's physically there. So, um, you know, if I was to purchase a, uh, I don't know, a very well-known store in an area that had a very good reputation, um, they may have a certain amount of assets and then liabilities against those assets, but maybe I, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to pay more for that because it's such a reputable place. So that would be an example of the Goodwill. And as I mentioned earlier, our fixed assets get de depreciated, but intangible assets get amortized. So this is just an amortization classification. So intangible assets that are subject to amortization, meaning spreading the cost of that and expensing it over the life of it, are patents, copyrights, and trademarks, if the trademark has a finite life, and then the franchises. Okay, so anything that went on the books as an asset will eventually be expensed over time. The only exception to that, so things that don't get amortized, are goodwill, never ever amortized and trademarks that don't have a definite life and those would be the only two exceptions and this is just an example of how I might amortize something so I'll increase my amortization expense and I will decrease the asset if I'm amortizing something and it's always straight line always use a straight line Okay, same with that. Here's an amortization expense for a franchise. All right, so let's talk about our last category, which is natural resources. So natural resources would include things like oil and gas, lumber, salt, you know, those kinds of things. Okay, so they are not depreciated or amortized. They are actually depleted. So how do we record it if we actually purchase some natural resources. So that is recorded at the cost plus whatever else it takes us to get that natural resource ready for you. So if there's land I have to clear away to get to my cave that has my natural resource, that would all be included in the purchase price of that asset. Okay, so and I made you a happy little table here that just kind of um, talks about 
the, it just puts it in a table form so you can remember it. Okay, so let's talk a lot more about depreciation now. So the dictionary definition is a decrease in the value of an asset, but what we're basically doing, that's according to Webster's, but what we are doing and the way we see it is we're actually allocating the cost of the asset over the duration of the useful life of that asset. So that's how we see depreciation. So here I may pay for a delivery truck up front, but the benefit I'm getting from that is over a time period. So what I want to do is expense the amount of the decrease in the value of that asset over time. Okay, so there are three common methods to depreciation, and I'm going to go over these individually with you. One of them is straight line, the other is decline, double declining balance, I think it's called something else sometimes, uh, accelerated depreciation, and then there's one called activity based, which is based on how much it's used. It could also be called uh, units of production. Okay, so here I'm going to give you an example. A local Starbucks t pays $1,200 for maybe a new espresso machine. That new espresso machine is estimated to, to um, be useful for four years, so how might I expense that? I'll take that $1,200, assuming it's going to be worth nothing at the end, divide that by the four years, and every year I'm going to record a depreciation expense of $300, and then I have a, this is a contra account, accumulated depreciation for $300. So this is what my, after the first year of taking part of the depreciation, here's the whole cost of my equipment, there's the accumulated depreciation, which means I now have something called a book value. Okay. So in another example, if I have a salvage value, what is a salvage value? Well, let's say I purchase a car and it costs me $40,000 and I think I'm going to drive it for five years, but at the end it's not worth nothing unless you donate it. Maybe in this case I've estimated that after five years maybe I'll be able to sell that for $5,000. So holy cow, over the over the duration of the the time that I've had that car, I'll need to depreciate $35,000 of that car, which may make sense. It, that's maybe the value that it will have at the end of the five years, and I will have kind of used up or expensed the rest of that. So to figure out how much on a straight line basis, how much to depreciate every year, I'd simply take, well, I purchased it for 40,000. It's going to be worth 5,000 at the end. I think it's going to be worth, you know, good over five years. So that translates to $7,000 a year. So this will be your formula right here. Okay, so if I were to make an amortization table, I'm just going to blow this all out at the same time. I'm going to start with the book value. This is what I purchased the truck for, or the car, whatever I did. Okay, the depreciation cost is basically what I'm going to depreciate it for. How do I know? Because, well, I bought it for $40,000. It's going to be worth $5,000 at the end. So I depreciate it $7,000 a year. I think this is a little overkill because we already know that it's $7,000 a year. So I'm going to skip that. Here's my $7,000 for year one. My accumulated depreciation, meaning how much have I depreciated so far, is $7,000, right? Because it's my first year. So now the book value goes down by $7,000. So I purchased it for $40,000. i have depreciated seven. dollars It's now worth a net $33,000. Okay, fast forward, year two. Year two comes along, here's my depreciation expense. Now I have $14,000 of depreciation expense. How'd I get that? Well, I took the 7,000 from last year plus the 7,000 from your shirt. Now I've got 14,000 in there. So my book value is nothing more than the amount that I paid for it, less how much I've depreciated to date, and there's my new value. And then I do that every single year, boom, ba doom ba doom ba doom And eventually, this is really neat how it works. The book value winds up to be down at the amount of the residual value. 
and at the same time, the amount that I've expensed has been spread over five years, and eventually after over those five years, I've depreciated the $35,000 from the price of that vehicle. So straight line is pretty easy, and most people use it, so we like to go over this one. But you can review that until you sort of get it. Okay. So what happens if it's been used only part of the year? So in this case, same scenario where I'm still depreciating at $7,000 a year, but if I purchased it on May 1st, for example, I don't wanna take a full year of depreciation because I actually haven't used a whole year of it. I've only used 10 months of it, right? There's all of March, there's May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December, 10 months of this. So I'm gonna take the $7,000, multiply it by the 10 months divided by the 12, and I come up with the amount of depreciation for year one is $5,833. For years two through five, it's that standard $7,000. But then on the sixth year, I kinda have to pick up those last two months that I was missing up here. So six years, so sometimes if I have a partial year depreciation, I may go into an extra year to make sure that I've gotten all the depreciation on that car or whatever I'm depreciating. So it still works out to be $35,000 in total depreciation over the time of that loan. Okay, I'm gonna skip my depreciation. Now, I wanna go right on to double declining balance here. So this one's a little bit trickier. So my steps are that I'm going to take a, I'm gonna to have to factor in what my straight line rate is. This is the same scenario where I bought something for $40,000, it's gonna last me for five years. So if you take one divided by five, you come up with 0.2 or 20% depreciation every single year. So for double declining balance, you simply take the straight line and you multiply it times two. And that's where I got this 40% right here. Woohoo. So here's how I do double declining balance and pay special attention because a couple of things are going to happen. So I'm going to take and start with the book value and I'm going to mult that's what it's over here and I multiply it times the 40% and I come up with depreciation expense for the first year of $16,000. So my accumulated depreciation since it's year one is the same. Okay. Now my new book value is 24,000. So what I'm going to do for year two to figure out how much to depreciate is I'm going to start out with the book value from the year end at 24,000, multiply it times the 40%, which is double straight line, and I'm now going to come up with $9,600. My total accumulated depreciation is 25,6. How did I get that? 16,000 plus 9,000, you know, like last year's depreciation plus this year's depreciation equals total depreciation, I now have a new book value of 14,000. So you do this for year three, and then the last thing, this is so important, now what I'm gonna, oh actually it's not even now, so I'm gonna take my 86.4 times the 40% gives me that much depreciation of 34,000, yeah, mm -hmm. and my total book value is now $5,184. Now, do you remember how much the salvage value was of this? It is $5,000. So the key is that if I were to take that $5,184 and multiply it times the 0.40, I'd come up with $2,073.60. If I took that away from the 5184, I would actually depreciate lower than the salvage value of this vehicle, which is bad, BAD bad. Okay, so we don't wanna do this. So actually what we're going to do is say, okay, I am now at $5,184. How much is it going to take me to get the residual value or the book value down to five grand. So you can see that it's $184. This is not calculated based on the depreciation rate. This is simply what I call a plug, okay? 
How did I get from $5,184 to $5,000? Well, I took an additional $184, and that was the only depreciation expense I got for the year, and not that whole 40% times the book value thing. Okay, and then we still wind up happy. Our accumulated depreciation is $35,000. The book value left over is $5,000. So you may want to study that again. All right, so let's talk about activity-based or units of production depreciation. So in this case, that same darn truck, 40,000, Estimated residual value is 5,000, but here they estimate they're going to be able to, to drive that truck 100,000 miles. So what I'm going to do is figure out what amount of depreciation to take per mile. So here I'm going to take the depreciation cost over the total units, or in other words, I'm going to take the 40,000 I paid for it, less the 5,000 in salvage, divide that over the total expected miles, that is going to be useful, and I come up with 35 cents a mile. Okay, so total cost less salvage value divided by how long I think I'm going to be able to use that thing, and that's what it is. So the cool thing about that is that you'll well, you'd be given you know, somebody has to tell you how many miles were driven of that, and then you multiply it times that 35 percent to come up with the depreciation. Okay. And the great thing about this is if it's a delivery truck, you're actually depreciating it at pretty much the way that physically that truck is depreciating. Because obviously the more miles you drive it, the more it depreciates. So that's why, you know, this one is kind of a very true to life one. But again, at the end, after the miles have all been driven at the 35 cents, in this case, it's going to be working out to the same depreciation expense of $35,000, and the remaining book value is $5,000. So that one's pretty straightforward. All right, let's take a look at all three of these. So straight line gives you the straight amount every single year. Now, I notice they all work out to be thirty-five dollars at some point that all of these are going to be equal to a total accumulated depreciation of $35,000. It's just how we get there. So straight line takes the same amount every year. You can see that double declining balance, whoo, look at that almost, it's over double what it was for the straight line, and then it tapers down. So you can see that this is much higher than this. So in the beginning years, there is more depreciation expense and maybe that's because that's when we're getting the most useful life out of that piece of machinery, okay? But again, um, it just depends on which accounting method you're using, and the activity base is kind of all over the board, and it's just based on when that gets used. So it's just kind of an interesting reflection. All right, and you can kind of see that depreciation over time, double declining is certainly the highest and then works out to be the lowest, so the most depreciation is taken up front for that if you use double declining, okay? But what do people use? Well, 92% of companies use straight line. All right. So how do we dispose of a long-term asset? So we can either sell it, we can retire it because it no longer works, or we can exchange it for something else. This is our last topic, by the way, in case you needed to breathe. You can always pause me and then come back. All right, so here's how I might dispose of an asset that I have. So again, here is my original truck for 40,000, 5,000 useful life over five years. Assume that they use straight line depreciation. What happens if we sold that truck after three years for $22,000? What happens if we sold it for $17,000? What if we retired it all together and nobody got anything out of it after three years? Or what about we exchange it for a new truck? So we're going to go through all of those uh, instances. So if I sell the truck after three years and I've depreciated it for $7,000 a year, what's it going to look like? Well, the original cost of my truck was $40,000. I've depreciated three years because remember it said after three years they decided to tell it, sell it. So I've depreciated $21,000, 7,000 times the three years. <laughs> so the book value at the end is 19,000. 
But holy cow, I sold it for 22. I did good, didn't I? Mm. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the cash. Here's my 22,000. I'm gonna take out the accumulated depreciation, right? Because that's how much I've depreciated so far. That was my contra account. That 21,000 was sitting in there as a contra account. Contra account in this case was the credit. So that was how I was increasing it. And now, I'm gonna take the equipment, because remember I'm selling it, so I'm gonna take that off of the book. So here's an asset being credited, which is reducing it. But do I balance? Tell me, tell me, do I balance? There's I don't balance, holy cow. So what's gonna happen? So now here is where I'm going to recognize the gain on the sale of my equipment. And this $3,000 is just basically saying, well, I got in 22, I depreciated 21, I'm taking the equipment off the books, so that means that I have a gain of 3,000. And here was also the calculation up here. Okay, a gain is a lot like revenue. Do you remember when we've increased revenue, which actually serves to increase our owner's equity at the end of the day, is a credit? So a gain is kind of like a revenue, where a credit in this case is a happy thing. Okay. What happens if I sell the truck after three years for $17,000? Again, same scenario. So I bought the truck for $40,000. I've now depreciated $21,000. So the net book value of that truck is $19,000. And I'm only selling it for $17,000. Oh, man. Well, that doesn't sound like the best deal, does it? But here I'm going to take in the $17,000. I'm going to take the accumulated depreciation off of my books, take the equipment off of my books and I am not quite in balance so here I'm going to take a loss and in this case a loss is kind of acting like an expense as well do you remember how we debit losses or excuse me we debit expenses okay well we debit a loss and both of those the loss as well as the expense serve to decrease my owner's equity so I hope that's not confusing. To me, it's pretty straightforward. All right, so here, what if I just retire the puppy? Now what do I do? So nobody's going to buy it, right? I'm going to take the original cost less the depreciation. The book value on there was $19,000. Nobody's going to buy it. Maybe it just turned out to be a piece of junk. So here I'm going to take the accumulated depreciation off of the books, take the equipment off of the books, and the rest of it is a loss. And what happens if I trade it? What happens if I get a new truck? And my new truck's worth $45,000 and I put $22,000 down, I mean, I financed 23. Now what's it gonna look like? Well, again, I still had that same old truck less the amount that I accumulated. So the book value, what that truck was really worth to me was $19,000. So here what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put the new truck on my books, take the old depreciation off of my books. I have to come up with, this is almost like my plug, my 22,000 here. It's like me taking in a trade into a car dealer, right? How much cash do I have to cough up to be able to get my new car? So here's my old equipment I'm taking off of the books. New equipment's coming on the books. My old depreciation is coming off. And this is the amount of cash that I have to pony up in order to buy that new car. And these following signs, uh, slides are, um, we're just taking some selected financial uh, data from a couple of fairly like companies and the next slides actually go through the analysis part so who has the better return on assets here you can see that Walmart's return on their assets is eight if you look back let's look back and see so we're going to take net income over our total average assets and this gives us the return on assets so if you think about this what this is really saying is, how productive are my assets? I bought a new building. I bought some new machinery. Or I've done this, that, and the other thing. Um, so how much 
um, are my assets actually producing in net income? And that's what that return on assets is telling me. It's just an indicator. It doesn't mean good, bad, or ugly, but you can tell that, you know, see how different the net incomes are, but we can still compare return on assets to give us an indication of who's doing perhaps better on income with their assets. So, you can just, these are just some of my descriptions over here, and you can kind of study these. And then the final ones, I've given you, I think, oh, maybe seven slides where you can take some concept checks. You can just kind of quiz yourself on how well you understood the material that we went over today. So, happy chapter assets. <laughs>